good place. I guess I shouldn't have started recording yet. Um, we went quite a bit beyond that. Alright, let me, let me pick it up here. Yeah, question. Uh, is the video's link on Moodle's? Yes, it is. It's on there. Yeah, and again, if you have any feedback or, or comments on it, let me know. I think it worked pretty well. So, why don't we pick it up here? I think this is well, slide 25 uh, of the estimation theory slides. And um, the thing that was different here uh, that I started to incorporate is now, um, in addition to simply knowing that what we measure is a combination of a noise that is Gaussian additive noise and the unknown number that we're trying to estimate, uh, the unknown, uh, say, variable, um, is that we're, I'm now giving you the knowledge that we know that x is within some finite range. And the question is, how do we incorporate that knowledge in order to get a more accurate estimate of what x actually is? And last time we said, well, uh, the natural sort of intuitive thing to do, the thing that I would have done if I didn't know about this theory, is just say, if the value of y that I get, if it's outside of this range, then simply put it up against the limit of whatever it is. So if y is uh, smaller than x min, and y is just noise added to what I'm trying to estimate, then I'm going to estimate x as being equal to x min, and vice versa. But it turns out that's not optimal. Uh, in, in a variety, by, by almost any measure, um, and especially if we're thinking about mean squared error, it's not optimal in that sense either. And so the natural intuitive thing to do in this case would, would mislead you. One more slide. I don't know how that's going to work. So it's over, overwrite our ad. So I wonder if when you go to the slide, if the audio is going to switch back and forth. It seems like the app wants me to be very linear and how I go through the slides, so I guess I'll, I'll try to do that. Um, so this is the natural estimator, and again, it turns out that using the natural estimator, and by natural I just essentially mean what most of us would, would choose, uh, not knowing anything else better, um, is not optimal. And there is an optimal estimator we can use, uh, and it's not the same. And the way... This is maybe different um, about the methods we're using, is rather than treating the thing that we're trying to estimate as an unknown deterministic number, we model it as a random variable. So we assume what we're trying to, um, trying to estimate itself is a random variable, and that's a, a different mindset, and I'll say more about that is, as we get to it. And so then the question is, if x is a random variable, and this is all you know about it, is that it's bounded between those extremes, then how do you model that? What's its probability density function, for example? And um, a simple PDF that you can use that turns out to be quite common when this is the only information you have is to say, well, I, I don't have any information. There's no reason to believe that x is more frequently at the midpoint between these extremes than it is at any other location. The only information we're given is that it's bounded. And so I'm going to model that and this is a, a key thing that you'll need to be skilled at if you're going to be using state space techniques is, is designing models. This is where a lot of the design comes in as engineers, is using your judgment to design appropriate models. And this is the first example of that that we see. So we take this information from the domain and we make the design decision to model this as a uniform distribution over the range between x min and x max. It's a very reasonable thing to do. You can defend it for your, your colleagues and fellow students. Um, it, it makes sense to use that model. Um, <clears throat> so once again, we've switched now to thinking about the thing that we're trying to estimate as a random variable, and not merely just some unknown number that we have to come up with. It's a random variable, and that's a, the key distinction between this and classical estimation theory. So what do we mean by optimality? I, I emphasized last time, if you're going to use the word best or optimal, be prepared to defend what you mean by that to be able to define that precisely because it's ambiguous otherwise. There's a number of different ways uh, that you could define best or optimal. 
And in this case, um, I'm just going to focus on, for, the, for this example, the mean squared error, but a different type of mean squared error than we talked about last time. This is called the Bayesian mean squared error. And it's different uh, from what we saw previously, because previously x was uh, not a random variable. x hat was. It depended on our observations, which were random because of the noise. But x wasn't, and now x is. So we've got two random variables um, that we need to think about, and that changes a lot of things in how we approach this. So when we're taking this expectation, the expectation really, since, since x hat depends on y, is over the joint distribution of y and x. It's not just about y anymore. Now we're taking into account the fact that x is a random variable, and there's some joint distribution um, that we need to think about and, and maybe have. And so to help drive home the difference between sort of the classical estimation approach you may have learned about in other classes and the approach that we're using, let's see if I can move this, uh, is that the classical approach is only optimizing this over the distribution of y, where x is a parameter of that distribution, possibly, uh, but it's just a parameter. It's not itself a random variable. Uh, with the Bayesian approach, x is now a random variable, and rather than doing this over the distribution of y, where it's parameterized by some x, we're now doing the um, optimization or defining the squared error over this joint distribution. And so there's two integrals there. There's the joint distribution that we need to be thinking about. Are there any questions on that? Do you, is, this, is this clear, this idea? It's central. Okay. And Eric, if, if you have things to add to any of this, feel free to, to jump in. Correct. <laughs> if, uh, if it comes up. So, we've got classical approach that you may or may not have learned in other classes, and then the Bayesian approach. And again, in this case, we're just working with a simple model. Just move that up so that you can see it a little bit better. So, just to repeat myself and drive this home because it's important, in the classical approach, we're trying to estimate something that's fixed, but it's an unknown parameter. Well, shoot. Uh, this is the wrong set. Let's see. Let me switch. Um, these are the slides that I used last time, and I updated them today. So, in the classical approach, x is a fixed but unknown parameter, and uh, if you can perform the experiment multiple times, if you're doing a recording in the ocean from a hydrophone, and then you come back the next day and get another recording, come back the next day and get another recording. In this classical approach, whatever it is that you were trying to estimate isn't something that changes from, from one recording to the next. It's fixed over these realizations. When we think conceptually about performing the random experiment that generates the data, in the classical approach, the thing you're trying to estimate isn't changing. There may be other things to change. The noise changes from one realization to the next, one experiment to the next, but what you're trying to estimate doesn't. Um, it's constant over the entire ensemble, is, is what they talk about in probability theory, the entire ensemble of experiments. Um, and one problem that you get into sometimes with a classical approach is when you try to come up with an optimal estimator by, let's say, um, maximizing the likelihood that we talked about last time, um, you'll often find out that that estimator depends on the parameter itself that you're trying to estimate. Um, this occurs, for example, if you're trying to estimate the... Um, I, I think most of you are familiar with an autocorrelation function, and if you try to estimate the variance of the autocorrelation, it turns out it depends on what the true autocorrelation is, which you don't know because you need the data to estimate it, and so you end up in this, in this sort of unsolvable loop in some cases. You know, a lot of the techniques that are taught and that you learn about in signal processing involves linear estimation where you don't run into this problem, but there are many cases where you do, and you're just stuck at that point, and you have to resort to approximations that, that don't work in certain cases. The Bayesian approach is able to overcome that. Um, for those of you that are familiar with, um, with an underdetermined set of linear equations, uh, there's a set of techniques called regularization that sort of bias the solution towards a certain value. And the Bayesian approach does the same thing. If, if you're not familiar with that, it's okay. I'll, I'll explain what it means more in a bit. The thing we're trying to estimate is a random variable. It's different for each realization. You perform your experiment. At different times, you get different values. And often what we care about is not what is x for this realization, 
But what is x across the ensemble? What is x on average, where it's the state, you know, x is the state that you're trying to estimate? Um, so it changes. And one nice thing that always happens in Bayesian estimation theory is that the optimal estimators do not depend on x. It's a random variable, and it gets integrated out when, when you're doing the math and, and doing the expectations. And so you can always um, realize these. It doesn't mean that you can actually evaluate the integrals analytically, but at least you've got integrals. You've got equations that give you the right answers, the answers that you're interested in. So they overcome uh, this limitation that you sometimes run into with the classical approach, which is, is really helpful. So those are a lot of the key distinctions. Oh, this is actually the slide that I was looking for. Um, so it is updated. Um, so just a little bit on notation. In a classical case, um, oftentimes in, in most books and, and, and uh, papers, um, the PDF of the random variable, the thing that you can measure, is parameterized, just like a normal distribution, you have to know what the mean and the standard deviation are. The mean and the standard deviation would be examples of parameters, and those would be x. Those might be things that you're trying to estimate, is an example. So y is the uh, essentially the random variable, and these are parameters of the distribution, and those are what you're trying to estimate in the classical case. Again, they're not random variables themselves. Um, when you look at this from the standpoint of treating it as a function of x, where x is the variable, and you're evaluating it at whatever measurement you actually acquired, whatever, whatever y you actually observed, then it's called a likelihood function. Um, it is an unconditional probability density function. What that means is that this is not p of y conditioned on x, because x is not a random variable, it's just a parameter. And again, a good model of that is thinking about the mean or the variance of distribution. So in our simple example of the random variable y being equal to something plus some noise term v, in this case I denoted it as mu, and I did it as normal phase, not bold phase, because it's just a parameter. It's not something we know, it's what we're trying to estimate, but it's just a parameter. And the likelihood function, if we were to think of this as a function of mu, for, um, for known variance and for whatever value of y we actually measured, uh, then that, ha that be would be the likelihood function. But this is, is what that probability looks like. It's not conditional. Only y is the only random variable that we're, we're dealing with. Well, maybe except for the, the noise random variable. The Bayesian case is uh, quite different than that. If x is a random variable, um, then the PDF now is represented as a conditional PDF. It's the probability of y conditioned on whatever x is. And this is what is called the conditional probability. It's also ca called the likelihood function, even though it's not the same likelihood function in the classical case. So there's an overloading of the term likelihood function here. It means something different in the Bayesian context than it does in the classical context. It's a conditional PDF. It's not unconditional. And as an example, let's say now y is equal to x that you're trying to estimate plus the noise term v, and uh, now all three of these are random variables. And uh, the, there's a PDF, you could think about the joint PDF between y and x, or you can think about the conditional PDF, or what we'll call the likelihood function, of the probability of y given a certain value of x, and then I put in a semicolon because I'm still treating sigma the variance of the distribution as an unknown fixed parameter, not as a random variable. So that's the, the distinction between the two. They look very similar, and that's why I wanted to spend some time going through this and explaining the differences between them. So what we're trying to estimate is a, is a random variable. That's the, the key idea and the key difference in context. There's another key difference I'm, I'm coming up on. So I think uh, all of you took um, a course, uh, or at least part of a course, in probability theory, and one of the first things that comes up is, uh, is Bayes' theorem that more or less says that the joint distribution can be written as the product of the conditional distribution and the um, unconditional distribution. So I call this the joint, this is the conditional, and this is the um, unconditional, or 
there's other names for that as well that I'm blanking on right now. So when we look at the mean squared error of uh, the difference between, I wrote x and x hat in this case, over the joint distribution, if we group this and, and use Bayes' theorem uh, so that we've got the conditional, the probability of x given y um, over x, if we can minimize this for every single value of y, then we will minimize the overall integral. If we can minimize this for every single value of y, for given value of y, if this is minimized, then it's minimized for every individual value of y, then we've found the optimal Bayesian estimator. And so there's, there's a neat trick that occurs here where the problem of minimizing this over the joint gets reduced to minimizing this over the conditional distribution for the single integral. And that's, that's convenient. That's, that's helpful um, to do. Are there any questions on this? I know this is a lot to absorb, and I was just studying this, so it's fresh in my mind. And I don't want to go too fast. Slow me down or ask questions if part of what I'm saying isn't, isn't clear or isn't clicking. I'll give a concrete example. Pull all these concepts together. So if we focus on just that one integral uh, on the, the center, the, the mean squared error over the conditional PDF, and we do the usual trick, we want to minimize this at the minimum, the gradient should be equal to zero, or the derivative, if you like, should be equal to zero in the scalar case. And so if we take the derivative of this and set it equal to zero, then it should give us the optimal solution. And so, um, going through the uh, algebra and calculus, um, what we end up with after just a little bit of, of math, I guess it's mostly calculus, is that the optimal estimator, in this case, is um, x hat is equal to the integral of x times this conditional probability. And that simply is the conditional expectation of x given, given y. So that is the optimal Bayesian estimator for minimizing the mean squared error. And we'll be using that um, throughout this class. That'll, that'll be one of the things that we're always going after. It'll be more complicated because y will be long and, and vary over time and come from the state space model. And x will be more complicated than just being a scalar. But it's the same basic idea. It's always coming back to estimating this, although I will take one step back and say, really what we're going to be going after is, is the um, posterior probability that I'll talk about. So the estimator that minimizes the, the Bayesian mean squared error, the one that's optimal in that case, is the mean of the posterior probability density function. And this function is going to be the key thing that, that we're really focused on throughout the class. It's what we're going to be getting with the extended common filter, or I'm sorry, with the common filter and the uh, generalizations of the common filter. It's what we're going to get a direct approximation of with particle filters. And it's what we're going to be working with with the optimal tracking as well. It's all about this posterior PDF when you're um, doing Bayesian estimation. And once you've got this, you know, this was talking about, well, the mean minimizes the mean squared error, but if we've got the posterior uh, PDF, then we can measure any uh, measure of central tendency that we like. We can calculate the median. We can calculate the mode, which is called the maximum a posteriori um, estimator, the one that is the value of x for which this is maximized. And so... Um, this is, this is a key element throughout this course, is trying to get that posterior probability in the more general case where we've got a state space model um, driving the process. To give you a sense, um, well, back up. One problem that you run into uh, when you say, okay, so it's all about the posterior PDF, where is it? <laughs> you know, no one actually hands it to you on a platter and says, here's the posterior distribution, the posterior PDF. Um, you've got to go through the work or use algorithms where people, other people have already gone through the work of finding it, given what you know about the problem. So there's work involved. You, it, it's not usually given to you. It doesn't come directly from the state space models that will be 
that you'll be designing as engineers. It, uh, it's something that you have to figure out. And the normal approach to doing this is to use Bayes' rule. You know, in the simple case, we say, well, the posterior distribution, if we use Bayes' rule, can be written as uh, the probability of y given x, which we called the likelihood function before, times p of x, which we're going to call the prior distribution. This is our prior knowledge about the distribution of x, um, divided by the probability of the, the PDF of, of y. And uh, this could be written as this integral, if we like, where it depends on the same two terms, but it's just integrating out x, if you will. So I, I, I think many of you have probably seen an equation like this from your course on probability, but it's, it's much more important in this course. And uh, the state space model will give us these two terms. And there's more to it, but, um, but essentially we'll be getting those terms from the state space model. Um, I want to say a little bit about this bottom term. In order for this to be a PDF, its integral, its area, has to be equal to 1. It has to be non-negative, and its area has to be equal to 1. Um, this term on the bottom doesn't depend on x. We're trying to estimate x. This term doesn't depend on it. It's essentially a constant once we've measured y. And so you say, well, well, what do we do with it? Why is it there? And it turns out that the effect of this constant is such that it makes sure that the area of this is equal to 1. And in most cases, we don't need it. If we want to maximize, for example, if we say we want to use the mode as our estimate of x, well, the maximum of this over all possible values of x is equal to a constant times these two terms, but this constant doesn't depend on x. And so if you omit that term, uh, the maximum of this is equal to the maximum over of this product of just those two terms in the numerator, for example. And if you've got another way of normalizing other than dividing by this p of y term, uh, then again, you don't need it. And that turns out to be very fortuitous because this is something that you don't usually have directly. And calculating this integral turns out to be problematic uh, because we're trying to design algorithms that can be implemented computationally. Algorithms are very slow to evaluate and, some and in some cases um, essentially impossible if they're in high dimensions. And this will often be in high dimensions. And so if we can avoid evaluating that integral or having to solve this, that's great. It's going to turn out that that will happen frequently. If you didn't follow what I just said about this, that's okay. We're going to be revisiting the same idea a number of terms as, as we get into this. So this is just the first time that I'm mentioning it. Again, I know this is a lot to digest, but uh, that's, that's where things are at. So let me um, give you an example. This is what I was eager to get to. So seeing case that we have before, and this example is very close to what I would like you to do for the first homework assignment and come back and present to all of us uh, next Tuesday. I'm thinking about getting a, a bag with chips with your names on it, grab a chip out of the bag. Um, so uh, same thing, y is equal to x plus v, and we get a measure of y, and we want to estimate what x is. And we know that v has a normal distribution with zero mean and some variance that, let's say, is given right now. And if x is known, I know x is what we're trying to estimate, um, but one of the things that we're going to use is the likelihood function, the probability of y given x. And so one of the things you want to think about first is, let's say that we knew what the state was, we knew what the thing is that we're trying to estimate, what then is the probability or the PDF of y? What's the PDF of y given x? And, and there's a couple of different ways of seeing this. One is to say, well, v is a normal distribution with zero mean, and if x is known, then you're just adding the mean. It's got a normal distribution also uh, with a mean of x in that case. So the PDF of y uh, for a known value of x is just a normal distribution. It's essentially the same as the distribution of the noise, um, except it has a different mean. And so this term changes to y minus x. So that's the likelihood function in this example. I'll show you a plot of it in a minute. Okay. Okay. 
So, uh, and we talked about what the prior distribution was earlier. We said, well, we've got the information that x is bounded. It can't be any bigger than x min. It can't be any smaller than x max. And so our prior distribution was a uniform distribution, which means it had a value of 1 over x max minus x min over the range x min to x max. And everywhere else, it's exactly equal to 0. And so when we calculate the product of the likelihood function that we just talked about times the prior distribution, because of this prior distribution, this product will also be zero outside of this range. And so the posterior distribution, we were trying to calculate this here, that's the product of these two terms divided by this normalizing constant, is also going to be equal to zero um, outside that range. And inside that range, it's just the likelihood function that we saw for on the previous slide times the prior distribution that we saw for a few slides back, and then divided by an integral that, again, is just a normalizing factor. And here, I've just written the same expression, uh, and the only difference is that I denoted the entire denominator just by constant c. And again, it's not very important because it, it does not depend on x. This is only a function of, of y, which is given to us. We're assuming something that we can measure. All right, so here's the key conceptual slide, I think, of maybe this whole set of, this whole topic, this whole set of slides. This is probably the most important one uh, because it conceptually represents the idea of, of what's going on. So in this particular example, we assumed that, well, I should say I assumed, I, I chose, we're given the knowledge that x min is 1 and x max is 3, and we get a measurement, and the measurement we get is 3. So when we take our measurement, it's 3. And if we had chosen the um, intuitive estimator, we would say, well, your measurement is already uh, where I thought it would be. It's within this bound, and so I'm just going to estimate x as being equal to 3. It turns out, though, that doesn't minimize that mean squared error criterion that we talked about earlier. Um, if we look at our prior knowledge, uh, say it's got a uniform distribution between 1 and 3, and the height is scaled appropriately so that this... Um, has an area equal to 1. And if we say, well, what's, if, if we only had that prior information alone, what would be your best estimate of x? What would be the mean? And the mean would land at 2. So based on the prior knowledge, we would put our estimate of x at 2. We then get a measurement, though, and our measurement uh, gives us a likelihood function that looks like this. And if we were just to maximize the likelihood function and use a classical approach, we would put the estimate right here at uh, 3. And I'm sorry that that red line has shifted to the left. I probably should have put it right at 3 to maximize that. That's a copy and paste error. This is a change to the slides that I made today, and I, I didn't catch that. This should be right there. So if you were going to do a maximum likelihood estimate, well, the likelihood is shown by this plot. This is a function of x, and it's maximized right here, just like you would expect. You add noise, you get a measurement of 3, the distribution's going to look like this, and your best guess is that x is right there. The Bayesian estimate, however, is when you take the product of these two, normalize it so as unit area, and then you get a, a distribution that looks like this. This is the posterior distribution, and this is what we're going to be using for all of our estimators throughout the term. And it's not the classical likelihood approach. Of course, we're going to take into account our measurements and not merely rely on our prior information. And we end up with the estimate being at an intermediate value between 3 and 2. It's not exactly at one value or the other. It's in between. And a nice way of thinking about this is that it is, it is taking a weighted combination between what the measurement is telling us and what our prior knowledge is about where it ought to be. And that'll be a recurring theme, again, throughout this class, is, is sort of weighting those two uh, sources of information. The prior information that we have, that's represented by the state dynamics, when we could talk about state-space models, and what the measurements are telling us, the state, where the state ought to be, which is represented by the likelihood function. And one of the things I like best about this is that rather than there being some kind of magic knob that you turn, which is usually what you end up with, with engineering algorithms, where you say, well, all right, so the likelihood estimate is at 3, the prior estimate is at 2, and so, you know, I'll take some weighted combination, but I have to pick the weight. You don't have to pick the weight in this case. It's already optimized. Uh, if you accept, in this example, 
the Bayesian mean squared error is your criterion, then the weighting is already is already handled uh, by the the um, by the math, I guess, or by the theory. So you don't have to come in with a knob. Now that being said, there's always knobs. Um, and signal there's always knobs to turn. And I'll I'll show you well I'll show you where that is in just a second. Why was I doing this? Um, this is just going through the math. And the point I want to make with this is that we've got a problem. Uh, this is, you, you apply the math, this is the optimal Bayesian estimate that minimizes the Bayesian mean squared error. Um, and it looks beautiful, and mathematicians would love it. But as engineers, you'd scratch your head and be troubled by it. Uh, because if you had to implement it, you'd say, well, wait a minute, uh, I don't know what that is. You've given me an integral, but you haven't evaluated it. This isn't something that I can put into MATLAB or C or Java or Python or whatever you're using. Um, I, I can't implement that. And I can't implement that because there's no, there's no equation that goes through and will, um, will evaluate that integral for me. Your problem is you've got an integral right there. And you could approximate it numerically. Um, it is 2012, not 1989, and uh, we've got Intel in our backyard uh, that's making multi-core processors that seem to be proliferating and, and getting a little bit faster. Um, and so we can evaluate this numerically. And that's what I've done in these examples, is I did a numerical approximation of these integrals. Um, but you're not going to get away with that with state space tracking because in this very simple example, we were doing, I, I only had to do a univariate uh, integral. X is a scalar. It's not a vector. And as soon as it becomes a vector, and especially if it's a vector over time, uh, then this integral becomes of such high dimension that you wouldn't want to begin to think about trying to evaluate that numerically even on the fastest of today's processors. And so, um, so we're a little bit stuck. There's a little bit of a problem here that although we've got the optimal solution, we can't actually apply it to most practical problems because we'd have to evaluate multidimensional integrals for which there is no closed form ex expression, and we're just, we're just stuck. And particle filters, we'll see in about two weeks or maybe a week and a half, um, are a really elegant way of sort of getting around this problem. And so that's, uh, that's what we're coming up on. Um, there's another uh, important point that I want to make uh, about bias. We talked last time a little bit about bias and variance. And... Um, if you look carefully at this expression, the optimal Bayesian estimator in this simple example, you'll see that x hat depends on the observed data y. y is here primarily. Um, this matters less. It has less of an impact. And the um, prior knowledge of uh, x min and x max, we're evaluating this integral over x min and x max. And so it depends on both of those bits of information. It incorporates both the prior knowledge that we had in this case about where x was, as well as the data that we observed through the likelihood function. And this estimator is not merely y, as it would have been in the deterministic case, except in the case where x min goes to negative infinity and x max goes to positive infinity, and then it becomes that. Then it becomes the maximum likelihood estimator. And so one way of thinking about the classical approach is they say it's, it's the case where you have a uniform prior. And what that means is that your, your prior is just a constant. All values of x are considered equally likely. That's not what we'll do in most cases. But it's neat that the Bayesian estimator um, can become just like the classical estimation approach in the limit where you use a, a prior that is, says all states that you're trying to estimate are equally likely everywhere. So that's kind of cool. And it does approach that as you have that information. 
Another way of thinking about this, if you've got a prior that spans from negative infinity to infinity, that means you really have no information about where x is. I said it was between x min and x max, but if we push that out, we don't know where it is. And in that case, the Bayesian estimator says, all right, I'm not going to rely on your prior, and we'll revert to just a maximum likelihood estimator. Say or, or or a minimum mean squared error estimator, where it's only using the likelihood function. Um, however, that's not usually the case. You won't usually have a uniform prior that, that it makes every value of x equally likely, and uh, and so the estimator will bias the result towards the prior, and that's a good thing if your prior information is correct. It's a bad thing if it's wrong, and it usually is wrong. Um, usually the prior information you have is an approximation, it's not exact. Our prior information we will express in the form of um, our, uh, our process model. It, it'll be about how the state changes over time. And that's never exact, it's always an approximation. And so there's this trade-off between um, are, you, are you expressing your prior information about the state dynamics accurately and biasing this in a way that helps or are you pushing it in the opposite direction and making things worse because you haven't modeled the dynamics accurately? And so as you're debugging, as you're designing your model, you're going to want to think carefully and evaluate carefully whether the state really changes um, the way that you've modeled it and whether the prior information that you're bringing to help improve the problem is, is actually helping and not making it worse. And so again, we've got... With a Bayesian approach, we've got this weighting between the prior and the posterior knowledge. And, uh, and the weighting is neat because you don't have to pick the weight. The weight is picked so that it minimizes this Bayesian mean squared error, which is beautiful. Uh, the fewer knobs you have to pick, the, the easier it is to dodge rocks when your colleagues and peers are, are criticizing or cr critically evaluating um, what we'll be doing in this room. Um, so... One of the things that you should think carefully about in this example that is a nice way of thinking about the uh, weighting that's occurring between the prior uh, information you have and the measurement that you took is looking at this noise variance in the example that we just went through. Um, the noise variance uh, can really tells us how much information does Y give you about the state. If the noise variance approaches... Um, a really small value, if it approaches zero, then that means y is equal to x, essentially. Forget about your prior information. If you've got no noise variance, it's like you're not adding any noise at all, and in that limit, um, y becomes x, or in this case I said x hat becomes y, which it does with this estimator. Um, but in that case, you should, uh, you should rely on, um, on y and use y primarily and ignore your prior information. Does that make sense? I'll show it with the distribution in just a minute. It, just, it seems like if you if you picked a real bad choice, you would end up with a completely wrong answer then, though, because if your your uh, if your variance is going to zero, then there's going to be uh, the area under the the curve for the noise is going to get real high at some value. Right. Um, it, it, it will, but that's actually a good thing uh, because it's the distribution or, or the way that we're thinking about it the likelihood function is now getting very narrow at the right value so you're getting this sharp peak very close to the value of where x is it gets tighter and tighter at the right value so it's actually helpful it's a good thing what's bad is when you turn up the noise variance it should be intuitive to all of you that when you're adding noise, as you increase the variance of that noise, you're adding a random variable that is essentially bigger and bigger, uh, on average at least. Uh, and you have more uncertainty about what x is, and you've got less information now conveyed in y. y is equal to the noise plus the thing you're trying to estimate. If the noise you're adding has a large amount of variance, then you've got very little information in your, uh, in your measurement, and you now have to rely much more heavily on the prior information that you had. This is the second, maybe, most important slide of the deck, um, because it, I'm, I'm trying to convey that idea uh, with this example. So these, this is the prior, and this is the posterior 
and it's the same for both rows. The difference between them is in this case the noise variance is a third, and in this case the noise variance is, um, is three. So it's much larger, it's nine times larger in this case. And I, I, I regret that I didn't insert what the uh, likelihood function is in between these two, but it's a Gaussian distribution, and in this case it's narrow, and in this case it's broad. You can say, well, go through, and you know, the mean is just essentially the center of its distribution. This is the Bayesian mean now. And in this case, where the noise is much smaller, the Bayesian estimator gives us a value that's much closer to 3, as it, sure, as it should. We got y is equal to 3, and now the noise variance is smaller, so we should have an estimate that's much closer to 3. It's not exactly 3, because we're still taking into account this prior information or that's influencing it, but nonetheless, this is what our estimate is. And in the limit, as this gets smaller and smaller, this will get tighter and tighter, and that red bar, the estimate, the center of this distribution will shift to the right until it stops at 3. In this case, I crank the noise variance way up, and now, again, I regret not plotting the likelihood, but the likelihood now is, the, is still Gaussian, but it's a very broad Gaussian. And so you take the product of that Gaussian with this prior, you end up with something that looks a lot like the prior. And now the Bayesian mean is shifted much closer to what our prior estimate would be. If we only had that prior information, then we would estimate it as being 2. And, uh, and this is really close to 2, because we're not accounting for what our measurement is very much. Now, um, in the state space framework, you will usually know about what you're measuring. If you're measuring a voltage, if you're measuring a sound, if you're measuring an inertial sensor, you usually know how noisy your sensors are, because as engineers, we, we're usually able to characterize them. And so in this example, what that means is this variance will usually be known. But what usually is not known, and what you're going to have to model and design as engineers, is actually the, um, the, the prior knowledge that you have. And if we had turned the knob on this instead and said, well, it might be between 1 and 3 in one case, and in another case it might be between 0 and 4, and that would push the prior, uh, it wouldn't actually push the prior to the left, but maybe it's between 0 and 3, so you've got more uncertainty, then, um, then it would weight the prior less, and it would weight the, uh, the sensor information more. So this, this isn't a perfect example. I should create another one where what I'm changing is the, the width of that distribution rather than the width of the noise, because this is usually fixed. And the knob that you're going to end up turning is, has to do with your state dynamics and your uncertainty in your prior information. This is, this is what you'll design, and if you need to tune your tracker, that's where you're going to be um, changing the knobs. That's where you're going to be changing the values to get the, the performance and, and results that, that you should. So a lot of this is a prelude. We'll be going over a lot of these key ideas again, but that's where we're at. Any, any qu further questions or comments so far? All right. We make some main points, and then we'll, we'll take a brief break. Um, so the idea is illustrated by that example, and the example you'll be going through in the homework. And I'm asking you to essentially do something very similar to that with different distributions, preferably inspired by a real problem. Um, these ideas are true in general and will be true for the techniques that we're using. Um, one of the key ideas is that what we're estimating is a random variable that has this prior distribution that we're, we're spending time thinking about. You've got to assign it, and usually you're designing it. And what that means is you're usually designing, talking about tracking a ship moving through the ocean, then you're spending time thinking about how do ships on average uh, move through the ocean and how much variability is there about that average. Um, do I characterize it as a ship is usually moving forward and it continues moving forward and it changes its heading occasionally, or, or do, I mean, do, I, do I model it as having a constant elevation? I would think so. It's really a two-dimensional tracking problem usually. Um, but these are things that you'll be thinking about and modeling. And in the Bayesian framework, we will take that model and express that as a prior PDF, and that's where, where the design is. Um, we did a simple example. We said, well, the only information you're given is that it's within this range. 
and then we chose we, we chose the design of modeling that as a uniform distribution. Once you've measured some data, uh, then your knowledge is uh, summarized the, both the prior knowledge and the knowledge given by the measurement by this posterior probability density function. So it's really the star of the show for the entire course is that posterior probability density function. And uh, one way of defining an optimal estimator is to say it's the one that minimizes the Bayesian mean squared error. Um, and when we're thinking about the experiment that generated the data, you now have to think about, in an example of tracking a ship, the various random ship trajectories that you might try to track, as well as the random measurements that you might take, for example, from, from hydrophones or sonar, or whatever it is that you're using. And in this particular example, the optimal estimator is given by this beautiful, very tidy equation. I mean, you're like, why do you need a whole class? It's just one integral. It's fairly simple. Uh, and the answer is, well, there's a lot more to it, in part because nobody gives you this nice, tidy posterior PDF. You have to do some work to find it. And then you still don't get rid of the integral. And dealing with those integrals is problematic in high dimensions. You can't evaluate them very efficiently, and we'll have very efficient recursive algorithms that are really cute sidestep you. Um, I think I've already made these points. I won't drive it into the ground. This is more about the prior typo there at the end. And, um, and I want to say uh, just a little bit more about the controversy as part of the overview for this. A lot of statisticians, if you are trying to answer a question of whether a drug therapy, just as an example, I, I do work in, uh, in, in clinical trials and in medical applications, and I'm familiar with that context. And the way that often works is that a drug company will come out and say, I've got a new therapy for multiple sclerosis. It makes people far better, it makes them live longer, they're more functional, it's great. Um, we're going to compare this to, let's say, whatever the current standard of care is, the current best existing therapy. And then they go and they meet with a statistician and design this clinical trial where they collect the data and then they need to make a decision. Is the new therapy better than the current therapy or not? And uh, if you talk to a statistician and say, well, I took this class with Dr. McNames and he taught me about Bayesian techniques and I want to use a Bayesian approach to this problem and I've got prior information that this new therapy is going to be effective and so I'm going to bias the result in favor of the new therapy, the FDA is going to laugh at you. And the, you know, I mean, that's not going to happen, right? You can't always use that prior information. And a lot of statisticians are opposed on principle, saying, what are you doing adding in the systematic bias on purpose? That's cheating. That's not listening to your data. That's not letting your data inform you whether there really is a statistically significant difference, let's say, between therapy, the new therapy and the current therapy. And so there's a debate. There's statisticians that say, don't, don't use Bayesian techniques. It's not... Fair, you're, you're cheating. And then there's Bayesians, uh, which I guess are, are me in some cases, that say, uh, no, no, no. If your prior information is correct, it improves your accuracy. And it solves other problems, uh, like um, being able to actually come up with an estimator. And it's perfectly reasonable, especially if you're working on an engineering problem and not trying to make an unbiased judgment as to whether a therapy is, one therapy is more effective than the other. So it's not that Bayesian techniques are a panacea and appropriate for all applications, but for most tracking applications, which is what we're interested in this class, they're, they're absolutely um, better. And if you don't like them, one thing you can always do is switch over to the uniform prior, which basically means that this becomes a constant, that you don't believe some values of x are more probable than other values of x. And you just simply say, I, I have no information, and, uh, and then the posterior becomes proportional to the likelihood function, and you're back in doing classical estimation. So there is sort of an equivalence in a limit between the two approaches. Um, and I think I've already made this point, but just once more, uh, the main problem really in this, we can actually with enough math and forethought and using state space models and assumptions of Markov processes, uh, we can figure out what the posterior distribution is. But we still have this integral that we've got to deal with, or an integral. And it turns out doing those numerical integrals is the big problem. And the beautiful thing about particle filters is it's one 
pretty elegant way of addressing the problem of having to evaluate a multi-dimensional integral in a way that is computationally efficient and that you could run in real time on a modern computer. And I guess that's it for the summary. So you guys have any, any more questions about these ideas before we break? All right, well, let's do a, uh, a five-minute or so mental refresh, and then we'll, we'll talk about tracking.